You hear my train a coming. It's a great song by Jimi Hendrix. But we're not here to talk about the elder Jimi Hendrix. We're here to talk about the New York City subway and the parties that were once thrown on these trains back in the day. So, welcome. Sidelines of History. I'm your host, Gabriel Allen Tolliver. All right, so this is back in 2003. I'm riding on the C train back to Brooklyn, summer, a couple weeks before my birthday. And I was like, the idea came to, what if I had a party on the subway? What did, you know, like, what could that look like? So I started ruminating on it. This is how it went down. I had my two homegirls, my next door neighbor, Fiona Bloom, and my homegirl of town, Tony Dubois. Now, both of them, uh, you know, were in the music business, you know, marketing, branding, uh, photography and stuff. You know, that's the thing about living up in New York, you know. Oh, have a lot of talented people doing a lot of different things to pay the rent and try to step up, be on the come up. You know, at that time, I was like a freelance uh, producer uh, for places like MTV and record companies like Elektra. You know, mostly like hip hop related things, but you know, that's another conversation. So anyway, we got together. We figured out the train lines, which was the three and the Q, because they were express with the least amount of stops. And they went from end to end, from Harlem to downtown, over into to the end of Brooklyn. New lots for the three and Coney Island for the Q. So we started off on the three What was your recollection of how we started these parties? Um, on some next shit, <laughs> like definitely <laughs> something taken out of a sci-fi film, um, you know, revolutionary, unique, fresh, game changing um, and exciting. You know, something that you just don't ordinarily have a chance to really get behind. So for me, it was like a lifetime opportunity and, you know, I always like to push the envelope and I always like to turn things upside down and shake things up. Yeah. And that's what we did. These parties were thrown in the day before social media. You know, we're, we're talking like, we're talking like at least three to four years before Facebook went popular or public. Um, you know, Friendster might have been on there, maybe MySpace, but um, it was just, the parties were, um, we had email, we just sent out the invite. Like I went into, um, I went on the MTA site and took on the verbiage for like the three and the, tr and the Q train. And I patched in, in basic Photoshop, like, okay, you meet up at the last car at the express stations and you'll see somebody that will come out of the car with a sign that says party starts here. So this all went out in an email, you know, um, like a PDF file or something, and people just spread it around or they maybe texted the information in the early days of texting. So, you know, when I talk about texting back then, you know, we're talking about the, like the Motorola two ways or maybe Blackberry. So if you see anybody with a Blackberry, give them much respect, okay? Those, they, they are some OGs, okay? And they were probably at the party. And I remember being the PR person. Yes. Because you know, yes. that was the whole yeah. reason I came on board with this yeah. was to help you promote it. Like word yeah. of mouth 
and not go crazy with promotion because obviously it wasn't, you know, legit. Right. Uh, you had to be really careful with the wording and everything because of MTA shutting us down and transferring right. all of that. So I just remember the emails being very kind of clandestine and clandestine mm -hmm. and very um, kind of like uh, almost in riddles, you know, yeah. but, it, but it worked. Yeah. <laughs> we treated it like it was a speakeasy. Um, you know, people, people brought their own beverage uh, we supplied camouflaged elixirs, like basically like pure grain alcohol and, uh, and Kool-Aid. And we made jello shots. And in some cases they were um, green, green infused brownies. Oh, well, no, actually that was weed. I meant to say weed. Pot. Yes, yes. Chronic. Somebody brought some pot brownies. Um, oh, yes, that's right. And I remember somebody, um, they ate them. They, you know, I mean, that's the thing about if you're going to eat pot brownies, you really have to kind of, unless you haven't done it before or whatever, you gotta have, you have to pace yourself or just be careful. Oh yeah. Because I remember, yeah, man, um, uh, the woman that brought the pout brownies, she like, she got laid out. Like she, she, she ate too many of the pot brownies <laughs> and had to go home or something because she was too hot. history have we, you know, oh, have we made it over halfway yet uh have we made it halfway well i think we're heading on toward 14th street so we're getting close we passed 14th street, man. word yeah. hey kevin what's your uh, next stop oh god oh Moons. i remember the moonshine the moonshine punch yeah. oh we that was that was quite interesting and then i remember someone brought a radio or had a mixtape or something that they so we had a dj on there so I remember that, and then I do remember a lot getting text messages from people. Oh my God, I missed the stop! Oh my God, I'm gonna miss the party! I'm like, well, you better hurry up. We're at 42nd Street right now. If you hurry up, you might catch it over on 14th Street. Right. So it was just getting those text messages, and people were like, oh my God, I can't miss this. And then the people who found out about it later on, mm -hmm. they were tight. Yeah. They're like, I can't, because you know how it is in New York. New York is we're all about doing something that's different, that, that, that's, you know, that's fun and sort of like secretive. Not everyone is in the know. Only the people who are hip yeah. actually know about it. Right, right. So uh, there was a lot of people who were really upset about that. They're like, I can't believe that I didn't go. Everybody else, how can I, you know, why didn't you include me? I'm like, well, you know, hey, I'm sorry. I, I guess she wasn't part of the in crowd <laughs> you know when we throw these parties right i mean one of the first things people to ask is like did you guys ever get caught busted and I'm like nah nope never did because we we thought anyway so what happens was um you know new york nypd 12 5 popo whatever vernacular you all like to use these days uh, they would have these little observation booths at the uh, opposite ends of the tunnels that connected, you know, Manhattan to Brooklyn. So if you were on the back of the train, you would be parallel to one of these uh, control booths. A lot of times there was nobody in them. False sense of security. False 
sense of security. But other times, there would be officers in there. On the train, when we would come into Brooklyn, everybody would pretend they were strap hangers. Now, for those who don't know strap hangers, you see the definition there. And we would all be very quiet. This is the love train right now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> hold on, hold on. And they would be quiet. Everybody would put their drinks down or they would have their drinks in, uh, you know, those red bodega cups. We'd be very quiet. And as soon as the doors would close, we would get back to it. Music turned back up. And we'd get, a, you know, get the party with the thing on. But, you know, thankfully, um, with all these parties, yeah, we never got, never got the police coming aboard to break them up and stuff. Because, if, you know, if we did get busted, yeah, we, you know, we'd be down at the tombs. And as Biggie once said, I ain't trying to see central booking. I was honestly scared shitless. I really was. I was scared shitless in so many ways. I didn't want to be arrested. None of us yeah. wanted to be arrested. Right. You know, I wanted to go down in history, but not that way. I remember one particular subway party we had, I think this was um, when New York had a blackout, like in 2003, it was August 2003, New York had a blackout. And it was the night that we were having a subway party. This might have been our second party. And I forget, um, somebody knew somebody who knew somebody at the New York Times. And th this New York Times writer, his name was Randy Kennedy, I guess he was doing like the subway beat. Um, I don't know what he does now. But he came, he came through with a photographer and they did an article on the subway party. You know, I'm up in the picture, Fiona's up in the picture. Um, yeah, I don't know where Tony was at, but yeah, we're all we're up in the picture, smiling, dancing, you know. I can always say I'm in the New York Times. Somebody tried to talk shit like, well, whatever you done? I was like, I'll be like, motherfucker, I've been in the New York Times, what? And then we went to France. Yeah, France, Paris. See, Fiona, like I said, Fiona had hookups all throughout the music industry, you know, little deals here, there, there, whatever. Straight hustler, straight hustler. You had the connection there in France, Fred LeBouf, right? Of Fred, Fred Elalouf, Fred Elalouf. Ping Elalouf. Pong, ping, ping pong. pong, promotion marketing firm. But, but I remember you were able to get iced tea to bankroll our trip because we were going to do a, a record release party for iced tea on the train. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that? Oh my God. At the time I was dealing with Ice T's uh, publishing company or Ice T's, actually Ice T's management company, El Ellis Pacheco, Ellis. Okay. And I remember telling Ellis about the plans for doing this event uh, in pa on the subway and the Metro in Paris. And he, and he said, that would be such a dope place to do you know, a release party for Ice T's next project. He would go, he would love that idea. So I think he, they pitched it to him and he was down with the idea. And all I can remember is Fred saying that for Paris, that was the best thing that Paris has, has had ever had up until that point. It felt like a frigging football match. <laughs> Well, I can say in the city of lights, they never saw anything like that. We put subway parties on the map in France. He probably had over a thousand people in and out on and off that train. Because it would be a impressive Everybody was so like wild out of their minds, you know, like so 
over the top excited and had never experienced anything like it. And there was so much joy that we brought to every, every participant on the train, every fan just was like, you've got to do this every week. <laughs> like, yeah. You need to come back and do this every mm. single week. Fred said he'd never had that much attention for any project he'd ever worked on. Wow. I remember that. You ever thought, because, you know, I get this question all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned before, when are you guys, when are you guys going to do another one? Right. And so, you know, I, I sometimes I kind of like, oh, maybe we should do like this one, maybe an anniversary type, you know, thing. But right. I, I don't know. A moment in time that, that can't always be, I mean, it could be replicated. But wonder if you even want to, if we even want to replicate. Well, you know, you know think... Tony's suggesting that we have a 20 year reunion party in 2023. I do like the 20th anniversary idea. I do. Yeah. Just like a one off, you know what yeah, I mean? One -off. Just, yeah, just one off. Just one and done. Just one, <laughs> one and done. done. <laughs> yeah. These were historic times. I mean, we did, you know, you didn't realize the, you never realize the history that you're contributing to until years down the line, you know, mm -hmm. when we realized that there was a place and time for what we did that was historical. You know? Yeah. I'm glad that, you know, we were part of an amazing journey. The way I see it, we did about four or five, never got busted, got written up the New York Times, and it was on the dawn of uh, the social media age. It was an interesting time of seeing a group of people, of diverse backgrounds, getting their swerve on, having a good time. And it's very poignant in this day of uh, COVID-19 and the notion of social distancing. Wouldn't have been a thing. So it is a capsule, a moment in time. And um, shout out to all the people that experienced the subway parties here and abroad. Big love to uh, Fiona Bloom and Tony Dubois. You know, they say teamwork makes the dream work. And uh, yeah, we did it. This is Gabriel Tolliver. Thank you for watching Sidelines of History. If you wanna continue to watch, follow us, subscribe, hit the buttons, all the social media, all there. Thank you, until next time.